you want to study the outliers, then you just focus on that. So put it depend on what you're trying to study or learn from the data. All um, right. Yeah. So, um, so that's right. So um, if you can, if you're trying to study what is the mean here, and this you have one data point. It's not here. Maybe it's way out here. Um, and, and there weren't too many, you know, it's, these are unlikely the further they get out. And there's not a corresponding one the other way. It may actually alter your mean a little bit. Yeah. Um, so if you fit by just taking the mean of your data as your sample mean, this may not be the, um, then removing this point may give you an actual, a better estimate of the true mean. Um, um, and, and, it, and you can do things where you actually fit the best Gaussian to the data. Um, and um, um, I'm not going to go over these techniques, but you can do that. And that will actually be more robust to this outlier. Even though you have an outlier, still if you chose the mean to be you know, here, it's, 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 it's going to give you a better fit. Um, and so there, there are ways of like smoothing your data with kernels I'll, I'll talk about in, in, in a bit, which will help you um, think about these ways uh, uh, more robustly. So, so if you can still build a model, then, then you shouldn't really worry about the outliers. You can keep them in your data set. Your goal of the output is some sort of model of your data. Right? That's generally what your goal is in data mining, is to somehow construct some simpler explanation of what your data is doing, some simpler pattern. And if you can do this even with the outliers in there, then there's no real need to actually take if your goal is to study the extreme points, then you need to know what is the center of reference to study those. So you don't want to take them out, you want to kind of save them and analyze them for later. But if you can build the model so you get a good notion of center, then it will allow you to, to study them. That's fine. So, so in general, picking this threshold of what is too large is, large is not an easy problem. Um, you can sometimes, in some cases, you can kind of do some form of, of cross-validation where you use different thresholds and you have to leave some data out and see how well it predicts it um, based on your model if you kept the data in or out and learn over the form parameter using cross-validation. That would be one way to do this. And then a, a less rigorous way, but might work better for, for, um, for something like clustering, is to actually just use this um, um, just use this elbow technique, where you look at all these residuals, you plot them, and as you get further and further out, there tends to be less of them. You say that's a good place to chop it off. And if you're dealing with the data set just once, and you're 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 working for a company as a data scientist, and they give you the data, and you say which are which are the outliers I don't want to worry about, just plot them and look at which ones have really large residuals, and those those are the outliers. So. Um, if you can plot the residuals, this often will, will tell you what. But you need to be careful that you haven't plotted things which are not great to your model. So go back and refit it and see how this affects things. And maybe iterate a few times, but be careful about these kind of different situations that you could get stuck with iteration. Or, you know, there are kind of pay attention to the problems that might go wrong and kind of think through these things for your situation. Okay. Um, All right, so kind of what I wanted to say there. Um, so well, one thing we kind of touched on with this, with this uh, learning a model like a Gaussian is that sometimes instead of actually um, instead of removing that wires, um, Um, you can just downweight the outliers. You can say, when I'm building an average of my data sets, the points which are far away are weighted less than that average. The average is you're adding up the, all the locations and you're dividing by the number. But if they had a, had a weight, um, so you could say a weighted, um, um, if you had a weighted average where you had a, um, some weight function, 
that goes from every point to some positive number, then what you do is you say that um, p bar with the weight is, is going to be the, the sum over um, all the points times the weight of the point um, divided by all the points and just the weights. Right? So now if the weight was the same for all of them, like the weight is one, then this is just the average of the points because this is then just dividing by the number of points. But if you have a weight, then you can do this weighted average. So then you say, you can look at the likelihood of, of all these points based on kind of, one way of thinking about this is the height of this point based on the Gaussian you fit. So you first fit, fit this, uh, fit the best Gaussian, and there might be outliers, right? And then you say, um, so you, you, you do this by finding the mean and the standard deviation, and you say the likelihood is the height of this point here, and then you you give assign the point a weight based on the height of the Gaussian here, and then you can recompute the mean like this. Use this again and measure the standard deviation from this mean, the standard difference from this mean. Um, and this mean may have been slightly shifted because you've downweighted some outlier out here. Right, and so if, if you do this, you can kind of um, uh, factor out, you can kind of weight down outliers instead of completely throwing them away. If you're throwing them away, you're essentially setting the weight to zero and keeping all the other points which are not, you know, even if they're close to some threshold, you're still setting that, keeping that weight at one is what you're doing by removing. If you just downweight them in a smooth way, there's not some kind of a stringent cutoff where on one side they get their full weight, on the other side they get zero, and this way it's more gradual. And this will lead to a lot of less artifacts based on where you choose the cutoff, whether it's exactly three standard deviations or maybe it's 3.1 standard deviations. Those should, in principle, give you very similar answers. But if there are a bunch of points right in between there, between three and 3.1 standard deviations, the difference in the answers you get is gonna be pretty drastic if you just throw them away. But if you weight them down based on some property, then it's gonna be a very, it doesn't really matter what the threshold is. In fact, you, had, you didn't have to pick a threshold. You just did this in a smooth way. And so if you could think of a way of downweighting the points and then compute your structure using these weights, you can also factor these into like a least squares calculation, these weights, in a similar way, um, then this is going to have less kind of boundary effects based on where you pick a threshold. So this may be a smarter way of dealing with them than trying to actually take the outliers out. All right. Um, oh, okay. So, um, so all of these approaches needed needed some sort of parameter. Okay, when I chose to when I chose to throw away outliers past a certain threshold, this threshold was some parameter I had to choose. And there wasn't, and I mentioned there wasn't a great way of doing this. You could use the elbow technique or maybe cross-validation, um, but it, these are not great, always great for choosing this parameter. Even when you even when you did this technique where you downweighted them, maybe based on some likelihood, there are parameters that go into here. You had to somehow choose the standard deviation of your data um, in order to, to do this downward. Now you can use the standard deviation, but essentially you're choosing some model that this is a Gaussian. Maybe you didn't want it to be a Gaussian, it wouldn't be something else. There was some parameter you had to, had to choose. And so some people have tried to get rid of some of these um, some of these parameters in some sense. And they've used um, things based on density. And these don't always completely get rid of the parameter. Some of these look like this weighting approach where they just kind of push the parameter into another decision which is less important. Right? By modeling as a Gaussian and using the data standard deviation, I kind of didn't really choose a parameter. Um, or the choice of Gaussian maybe was a pretty safe choice for me. Right, so, so this is this uh, this downweighting is kind of the kind of the one form of these of these of these density based approaches. Um, there, 
Um, there are other ways uh, which are kind of along this line. So, so one is called um, the um, reversed um, nearest um, neighbor. Okay, so um, so how does this work? So has anyone heard of the reverse nearest neighbor? Okay, so uh, what you do for um, um, for each um, point in P, what you do is you find find Q which is equal to min of, of um, P prime in P not equal to P. So you can't pick the point itself of the distance between P and P prime. Okay, so this, so this is the nearest neighbor. Q is the nearest neighbor of P. Of, of not including P itself. Okay, and then you find find um, R, which is going to be min of P prime in P, not counting Q. Um, so this is Q uh, prime. Right, so, so this is, Q is the nearest neighbor of P, R is the nearest neighbor of Q. Okay, now, um, then what you do, is you look at the distance from P to Q and you compare this to the distance from Q to R. Now this distance is never larger than this distance, right? Do you see why that's true? Can, can R ever be further away from Q than P is? Right. Right. So it could be that R is equal to P, in which case this distance would be the same. But there could be a point which is closer to R. So if these distances, so if these distances are similar or they're the same, then it means that P is probably inside the inside the distributions. Um, but if the distance from Q to R is much closer than P to Q, it means that P is probably far away from its closest point relative to the density of the points. Right, so, so let's look at an example. Um, right, so if this base that is P is, is, the full, is the full set P. This is the this base set P I'm trying to analyze if it's an outlier. I find the nearest neighbor, the nearest neighbor may be this point Q. Right? And now I look at the nearest neighbor of Q. The nearest neighbor of Q may be this point R. Right? So now the distance between R and Q is very small. And it's small compared to the distance between Q and P. So then I say if this if the distance from P to Q is much bigger than Q to R, then I say P is an outlier. And so the, the nice, so this looks, looks good here because, say there's one distribution here which has a fixed amount of density, and then there's this, this other point which is further away, and I can, I can do this. But what's more interesting, let me show you a different example where this works. You've got some distribution, you know, which, which looks like this. Okay. Now, I want to argue that this point P is an outlier, but that these points are not outliers. And what's happening here is that the distribution is much denser here than it is here. So there are these other density-based techniques where you, you may say, let's look at how many points are in this region, and say if there are a lot of points in, this, in a region centered around a point, then it's in a dense region, it's not an outlier. But if I looked at, say, if I looked at this point and I looked at its region, this is very dense, right? There may be um, 
15 points in here. And if I look at this point in the same region, there may be zero points in here. But the density is changing as I go along. So this point is not necessarily an outlier. Right? But this point maybe is an outlier. And so if I look at, now if I do this reverse nearest neighbor process, let's say I start with, with this point here, and its nearest neighbor is going to be this point Q, and then Q's nearest neighbor maybe is, is R here. The distance between Q and R is about the same between Q and P. So it's within the density of that part of the distribution. Where if I looked at, if this point was P, and then I looked, this was Q, and you know it's still not very dense here, and this is R, still this distance is much less than this distance, and I can say that this point is an outlier. So this, this reverse nearest neighbor adapts to the local density of the distribution. So th this is important when, say, if, if you have some, you've put these points in some space here. And, and, there's, and if there's not like a, a uniform mapping over this, what this chord is. So let's say this is going to be um, the age of employees in a company. And this is going to be the income. And so let's say that the company it hires, maybe this is like a, um, a company that has people more in the, in the service side, and they hire young people to work as like, maybe it's like a high-end restaurant or like, it's like a hotel, right? So you have the people working kind of uh, at a, the, at the wait, as waiters in the restaurant or the cleaning staff or in the, in the front desk. They're usually younger people, and there are a lot more of them, and they're, um, and they're, uh, and they're also not being paid as much, right? As you get, there's more people in management, these people tend to be older, and they also tend to make more. And then there's the owner, who makes a lot, and maybe is a, you know, some old, some old guy in his 80s, right? Um, so this person really is an outlier, but the distribution of the rest of the people, it kind of, it changes as you, as you move here. So you shouldn't necessarily classify these people in the management as outliers, um, because the distribution is changing as, as the parameters. It's not a linear mapping of the density to the, the coordinates. And so this, this is, is not uncommon in, in many other areas. You don't necessarily have a uniform spread over the coordinates, but that doesn't mean that something in a less dense area has to be an outlier. Um, and so this allows you to adapt um, to this way automatically. Um, so, okay, but what is, what's possibly a problem with this technique? So, um, yeah. So you're saying that this technique goes in such a way that the density is If some, if some of the points around it change, I mean, you remove some of the points, its uh, process neighbor might be one of the other points, right? And then I'm saying that it, it might not work in such data set also, this thing. It might take some of the lab label if it's not out there, right? So it might. Um, right, so, 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 so I didn't quite understand your example. So th there is a case where you can detect something as an outlier when it shouldn't be. And, but I didn't quite understand your explanation. Maybe can you, do you want to restate it? Or? No, I'm saying that if, if uh, some of the points of this data set that you run here, okay, if, if some of the points change, okay, you remove some of the points, then the process neighbor to that point that you want as green will change. Right, okay. yeah, so if I, if I took out this point, yeah. then the nearest neighbor to this point may now be here. Yes. Right. Okay. And, and based on that, that point is that green point might, might be detected that way, right? Um, it, it might, but I, I may have to remove a lot of points before that happens. There's some, you know, if it's off by a factor two, 
If this is off by a factor two or three, I'm probably not going to say it's an outlier. Um, but if it's off by a factor ten, I'm pro I probably am. So by removing just a couple of points, you're probably not going to change this dramatically between a factor two and a factor ten. Right? This may be a factor ten difference. But if I remove this point, I've increased the distance to the nearest neighbor by um, by factor one point five. Right? used to be a distance, say this was 7, now this is a distance 10, right? And now its nearest neighbor maybe is here and it's only a distance 8. So, so it's still pretty robust because if I remove this point, then the nearest neighbor changes, but its nearest neighbor may also change. So, so it kind of, it may take that into account. So that, and there's another problem which is more, kind of more serious. It breaks with two closed outliers. Right, good. So let's say instead of this point up here, it's uh, instead of just being one old guy, it's an old guy and his wife. And, and, they, and they both co in it and they make the same amount and they're the same age. Right, so they're right on top of each other. So their nearest neighbor ours, you know, is the same point, it's back to itself again. Right, so this distance, these are the same distances to each other. So, so I, haven't, I haven't filtered out these out. Okay, so um, so how do I fix this? Pick a third point. You can pick a third point. Well, well, what if there are like yeah, there and like there, there, are, there, are, there are three children of or like like in the case of Walmart, right? There are like five heirs of a Walmart throne, right? And they all they all own about the same amount of the company, and they're all about the same age, right? So 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 what's special about three, right? Is it, is it? Yeah. Create the convex cell around it for the first set. Then build another convex cell for the remaining points. If the distribution is such that the difference between the two convex cell edges is a lot, that means that there's no density here. That is an outlier. And you keep on shrinking this till the distance is of some factor. Okay. Uh, good. I'll, 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 I'll explain this in more detail in a second. And this is an interesting idea. Uh, and, but I'll first, so the choice of, but I'll, I'll that's slightly different than what I want to finish this topic for. So the choice of three, you know, is fine. In, in general, you could say, instead of choosing the minimum distance, find the kth closest neighbor for some parameter k. Right, so find the distance such that there are k minus one points which are closer. And then compare that from, from say, q was the point with k minus one points closer, and then from q, find the point which there are k minus one points closer. Right? So the k nearest neighbor, and compare these instead. And by choosing some larger k instead of one, it's going to be more robust if k is large enough. Right? If k is too large, if k is n, then you're picking the furthest point and this is not very useful. Right? But you can, you can answer k nearest neighbor queries almost as fast as nearest neighbor queries. Well, if, if there's enough outliers, Right, right. So that's another good way of looking at it. If there, if you did use k nearest neighbors and say k was five up here, you say, well, maybe these are no longer outliers. There is some something generating. It's generated five points over here. Maybe it's worth looking at. Right. So, it's, so maybe if if the k nearest neighbors, if the if you look at the reverse k nearest neighbor, and it's still small, then you say, okay, it's not an outlier. There were k other things which appeared similar. So it's uh, then then if you choose the right parameter k, if something is far, it is an outlier. If not, that there is something generating this. I don't want to throw away this data completely. Yes, yeah, so that's that's a good point. Um, you still have to choose the right value k, but you can kind of see how this is now less less um, less sensitive as a parameter. You chose k large enough. Um, then something must, then if the, if the distance to the reverse nearest neighbor is small, is, is similar to the, to the original distance, then there probably was something which generated this phenomenon. And if there wasn't, then it's a small enough set of data which were off in this, off in this, way, in this way by themselves. Um, so it's kind of less sensitive, and you can choose any k in this area. 
you still need to figure out what is the right K to choose, but it's probably less um, less sensitive to your choice. And you could probably bear this out with some form of cross validation. Um, yeah. So, so a, a better version of this is the K reverse here. Is that clear how this works? Okay. I can go through an example if it's not clear, but okay. All right. So, um, the other thing that Amaya was talking about was something about the convex hull of the data set. So, so first, first of all, who knows what the convex hull of, of data is? And who's not in the computational geometry class? And who, and, okay, but, but you didn't raise your hand the first time, so do you? Oh, no. no it's, it's okay, all right, so, okay, so, so most people don't know what a convex hull is. So let me, Start with this. So, it's um, if you have a set of points, then the convex hull is going to be look like this. It's kind of the boundary of the set of points, kind of defined in a way where one kind of intuitive way to think about it is if you put nails in the in the whiteboard and you put a rubber band around the outside of them, that rubber band is on the convex hull. So if this point was a little bit further in here, then actually this line would actually connect straight between these two. How would you make a convex hull of one point? Uh, it's just that point. Okay. You have a very tight rubber band. What about two points? It's the line between them. Okay. So a more technical definition is that the convex hull is the smallest set such that if you took any point that's in the set, or any two points in the set, and you can, and you drew the line between them. This line segment is also in the convex hull, and then you can, you then now these points are part of your set, so you can also draw. So th th this only defines a set of lines, but then if you took any two lines and you draw all lines between these as well, this now starts to fill up a volume. And so if you repeatedly do this, if you're in d dimensions, d times. This will eventually fill out the convex hull. So take any two points, draw a line between them, and then repeat this, including the points on the line. And this fills out the convex hull. And it's, it is consistent with the definition. It's convex if you can go between any two points in the set and they stay in the set in a, a linear path. Okay. So now, uh, what was Amaya saying about using this convex hull for outliers? Right. So he was saying. If you have some points, some crazy points out here, and now the convex hull is going to look like this, right? Now you can think of this point, think of like this leave one out on um, cross validation technique. If you took this point out, the convex hull, the area of it is going to be much smaller than if, if, you, if you looked at the area of the convex hull with this point in. So if you look at that ratio of taking the point out versus not taking it out, and the ratio is about the same, then it's 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 not an um, then it's not an outlier. But if you take it out and the volume or the area changes a lot, then it probably is an outlier. In general, a point in the middle, if you take this out, the convex hull doesn't change. So it's definitely not an outlier. The points so the only points that could be an outlier are the ones that are on the boundary. So in, in general, all the points could be on the boundary, but in, usually in practice, you know, a very small number of them are. So you only need to check those points. And then there are definitions of, if you wanted to say, you can like, if you want to be a little bit conservative and throw away points that might be outliers, what people do is they, they take the points on the convex hull, throw away all the points on the boundary line, right? So I threw away, so, so let's say the first one, convex hull was, was these points. And I threw away all of these points. And now the next one, right, the, the next one is going to go inside of these. So I still have, so then it's going to look something like this. I forget to answer that part. Right, so then the next convex hull is this. Now, all of these points might, the ones I threw away might have been outliers, but I still kept the general shape. 
I can then repeat this and do this again. I've thrown away these points, and what's left is something like this. And so if you look at when a point gets thrown away, that's known as the convex hull, uh, the convex hull peeling depth. Or the depth of a point here is three. And you would need to peel away three convex hulls to expose this point, where this one is two, this one would be one, this is zero. So the deeper a point is, the less likely to be an outline. And so you could be conservative and throw away all the, all the convex hull points, um, and then just keep the central data and run your analysis on that. And you may have thrown away some inliners, but you probably threw away all the outliners. So people use this in practice sometimes, um, but it's very hard to prove the actual, actual properties about it. But in, in general, it works, works pretty well. And you can actually, you can, in the plane, you can compute n log n at the same time as sorting. Uh, you can compute a convex hull at the same time as sorting n log n. And you can actually compute the convex hull peeling depth, I think, in the same, in, in n log n also of all the points. So you can actually compute this pretty quickly. Um, and in practice, it works OK uh, in the plane. But you can't, like, you, you could have all the points on the boundary, and then it's useless. So in that case, it's not very meaningful. But in general, it might be useful. Um, cool. OK, so let me talk a little bit more about these kind of skewed, um, 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 these skewed distributions. So in particular, um, so who's heard of a um, heavy t um, tailed, so who's heard of a, of a heavy tailed distribution? So, so most people haven't heard of this, right? So. Um, so this is a, a distribution that is decaying in a way that's not exponentially decaying like a Gaussian, but it's kind of it's decaying in a way that's um, polynomial, right? So a classic um, actual example of, of this, or a formal uh, distribution which satisfies this, it is called the zip distribution. And have any of you heard of the zip dis distribution? Few of you. So the zip distribution, you you probably know because of language, right? So so um, is is where the is is where the frequency of an item is is proportional to the inverse of its of its rank. Okay. So 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 let me recall what the frequency is, or the, the relative frequency of it, or depends on your constant. Whatever the frequency is if you have a bunch of items uh, from some right, so the relative frequency is if you have a bunch of a set x and each of the items, so each of x So each of the items in the set X is drawn from some distribution or some set U, some family. So an example of this is are all the words in the dictionary. Right? So think of this as being all the words in the dictionary, and I've assigned them some number, right? I, I looked at the alphabetical order of, of all the words in the dictionary, and that's that's their number. You can think of this being drawn here. And then I can look at the frequency, so I can look at some large uh, text document like all the words on Wikipedia, right? And, uh, and, and I can look at the frequency of a particular word, right? And so, so let me, there's this large text corpus called the Brown Corpus. And, and let me write down some of the, the frequencies. So like the word the happens about, uh, uh, this happens about 7% of the time. So 7% is equal to 0.07, and this is equal to f of the, right? The word the. So, so that's the most common, the most common word. Then the next most common word is is of. Is this is about 
3.5% of the time. Um, and then the next word is, uh, is and, 2.8% um, of the time. Right, so it looks like I started at seven, I'm, after this first two words I'm already at 10%, here I'm already at like 13% uh, of the words, it looks like I'm not gonna get very far before I, I run out of words. But you know, there, there are actually a lot of words and some of them are very infrequent. Um, and so this, so, so this is, is the, the frequency. And so the zip distribution says that the words occur, now if I, if I sort them based on I, before I said this was, it was, it was the sorted, this was the sorted order. Now let's sort them based on the frequency. Okay, so I is equal to one, or none is equal to I equals to one, this is equal to I equals two, this is equal to I equals three for and. These are the most frequent words. And so then C in this case would be um, 0 0.07, because one over one um, is, is one. So I, my constant here is C. And then if I do one half, one over two, 7% 7, 7 divided by two is 3.5%. 7% divided by three is going to be about 2.8%. It's not exactly right, but it's kind of close. Right, and so if you look at the words, the ranking of the frequency of the words, it follows very closely to this, um, to this, um, um, this zip distribution. Whereas if they have followed something more like an exponential distribution, kind of like this Gaussian, that means the, if you look at, if you put the frequency i up here, the larger the frequency, the probability is decreasing exponentially. Where this is, this is more of, <laughs> this is a polynomial. So the, there's a difference between an exponential and a polynomial. And this can cause a lot of problems with a lot of the things that we were, we were trying to do before. Um, so for instance, so if we wanted to say which are the most, most important words, you know, I, I, I want to only have a speaking vocabulary. Um, if, if, I, if it was decreasing exponentially, I may only need 100 words in my speaking vocabulary. Now, this might work if you're Dr. Seuss, um, but for most normal people, you know, they, they use